Hey guys, Andre from High Performance Academy. Welcome along to another webinar. And this time we're going to be talking about launch control and how we can utilize launch control to give us fast, consistent, reliable standing starts. Now, when we talk about launch control, quite often I end up getting a few people uh, saying that they can get fast standing starts manually uh, just using their own combination of RPM and clutch position. Well, that's great, and quite often that will be the case with a really talented driver. They will be able to get good standing starts. The problem with this is getting consistency with those standing starts is a little bit more tricky, and it's really difficult for even a talented race driver to do exactly the same thing on every standing start, and this is where a computer is really hard to beat. You tell the computer what to do, and that computer is going to do exactly the same thing every time. So this is why relying on on a well-tuned launch control strategy can give you a real benefit and a real advantage on, a, on the start line. Uh, now, the other thing to mention here is that if you've got a driver who really is genuinely very talented and can get some amazing standing starts, well that's still great because what it means is that we can data log exactly what the driver is doing during that launch and then we can use that data and help replicate it using the launch control strategy. So either way, there's a lot to be gained here by using the launch strategy. As usual with this webinar, we will be having questions and answers at the end, so if you've got anything I talk about that you'd like me to delve into in a bit more detail, please ask those questions in the comments and the guys will transfer those through to me. Okay, so we've talked about why we, we need launch control and where that advantage is, the ability to get those fast, consistent standing starts. Also, just a subtle aspect there is that we can really fine tune this system and optimize the amount of wheel spin we get to really try and get the most traction off the line. However, the other aspect we need to talk about is how the system works. And really here, we're breaking it down into two types of launch control strategy. Uh, the First is where we are using the, uh, the ECU to provide just a secondary rev limit. So basically when our foot's on the clutch or the car's stationary, we've got a lower RPM limit. So instead of launching off the engine's rev limiter, normal rev limiter at let's say 7500 or 8000 RPM, we might be holding the RPM at 4500 until the clutch is released. So that's a simple strategy. As soon as the clutch is released or wheel speed is detected and the car starts moving, uh, then the normal engine rev limiter will be reinstated. Now the problem with this sort of system is of course once the car has actually left the line it's still up to the driver to actually control wheel spin uh, using the throttle. The other type of system that we have available is where we are monitoring the wheel speed as well as the ground speed. So uh, this is really only applicable on a two-wheel drive vehicle. So let's say here on our Toyota 86, uh, we're a rear-wheel drive vehicle. We are monitoring the wheel speeds on all four corners of the car through the ABS unit. This is data coming into the ECU via CAN. And from the front wheels, what we're getting is ground speed. Uh, so what we can then do is set up a three-dimensional table, essentially giving us a RPM limit relative to our ground speed. So let's just quickly head across to my laptop screen, and we'll see exactly this here on the right-hand side of my screen. Well, don't worry, we're going to talk about this in a bit more detail here, uh, but let's just full screen this. And what we've got here is a three-dimensional table doesn't actually need to be three dimensional, but we've got vehicle uh, wheel, vehicle ground speed on our horizontal axis here. And then the reason this is three dimensional is on our vertical axis, we actually, actually have the ability to uh, run a multi-position driver switch here. So we can choose our launch control strategy based on a driver switch. And this allows on the fly adjustment depending on track conditions. Let's say uh, the race uh, initially starts and it's going to be dry. And then on the outlap, maybe it starts drizzling or uh, pouring with rain. We can adjust the launch control strategy while the car's actually on the track. So the numbers inside this table are of course our engine RPM limits. And if we look at that graphically, uh, we can see a nice sort of exponential shape to this. Now we'll find out how we get that data uh, shortly as we go through today's webinar. Let me just head back across to my notes here for a second.
Okay, uh, so those those are our two main methods there. So the first method where we've just got either a simple clutch switch or uh, a simple system where the car is stationary. Quite often this is referred to as a two-step launch control or two-step limiter uh, and it's quite often used in a drag application. We'll see a little bit later on in the webinar how we can use this strategy as well to build boost. But of course, as I've mentioned, uh, the downside there is as soon as we drop the clutch, often uh, it's up to the driver again to control wheel speed. Uh, another consideration we need to factor in here is our clutch slip. So there's only so much that the ECU can do here and really what we're doing is using the ECU in some way, shape or form to limit the engine RPM and the reason we're doing that is because there's obviously a relationship in first gear between our engine RPM and our rear wheel speed. So by limiting that RPM we can limit the amount of wheel spin being produced. The problem is if we look at the relationship between engine RPM and our wheel speed, obviously when our wheel speed is zero, when we're sitting there stationary, uh, the engine RPM to achieve that if the clutch is fully engaged would also be zero. Clearly we don't want that, that's not going to work. If we drop the clutch and the engine RPM was clamped to zero, the engine's going to stall. So this is a little bit problematic and really to get really perfect starts, get the best possible start, there is a still a little bit of driver involvement that we'd like to have in here and uh, what this really entails is the driver not simply sidestepping the clutch, instead what we want to do is have the driver just gently release the clutch and allowing a little bit of wheel slip initially and what this does is it just smooths that transition between our engine RPM and our rear wheel speed sort of matching where we want it to be. So it prevents us needing to clamp that engine an RPM down too low and have a uh, risk of the engine stalling or dropping off boost if we've got a turbocharged car uh, but we don't end up with our wheel speed sort of jumping straight up uh, to uh, to a, an excessive level. So let's just have a look at that uh, on a little horribly drawn graph that I'm going to make here. So uh, let's look at a little two-dimensional little two-dimensional graph that we're going to draw uh, here. So what we've got here is our uh, wheel speed no. Let's try that again. Told you it was going to be a horrible drawing. Okay, so we've got our wheel speed on the vertical axis there, and we've got uh, our our start point is going to be right here. So this is where we are actually dropping the clutch. So what we're going to end up with in the perfect world is we want something that sort of ends up going a little bit like this. So we actually start with our wheel speed at zero. Of course what we end up getting when we drop the clutch with let's say 4000 RPM on board is initially our wheel speed jumps straight up and we've got a lot of wheel spin and then we sort of try and wait for it to catch up like this. So this is the area here where what we can really do is get some benefit from slipping the clutch slightly so that we don't have excessive wheel spin. And another key to understanding this as well is understanding how our tyres work. And uh, most people think that in order to get maximum acceleration from our tyre we don't want any wheel spin. That's actually not the case. Uh, there's several studies and tests have shown that uh, we find that depending on the particular tyre we're running that we'll actually get maximum acceleration with a small amount of wheel slip, somewhere in the region of about 6 to 10 percent. So we actually want the, the rear wheels in a rear wheel drive car to be just ever so slightly spinning and that's going to give us a traction advantage from having everything completely hooked up and no wheel spin at all. Alright so hopefully at this point we've got a, a bit of an understanding of the techniques available. We've got our basic two-step style launch control and then our ground, ground speed based launch control. Now the other thing that we need to discuss here is the way the RPM limit can be configured because this has a big impact on the reliability of a lot of engines. Uh, so when it comes to RPM limit configuration uh, we can choose to set up our RPM limit using either a fuel cut or an ignition cut. Now I've talked about this numerous times and there are some specific webinars in the archive that you may want to review if you uh, search for RPM limit uh, you'll get a little bit more background on these strategies and uh, the pros and cons of each but essentially in a nutshell the, the ignition cut style 
RPM limit can be quite harsh on engines that have uh, sensitive valve trains. One that I'll just pick out that I know quite well is the Nissan SR20DE and DET with their quite heavy rocker style valve actuation. Uh, these don't respond well with an ignition cut rev limiter unless the rest of the engine has been modified to suit and uh, if you're not careful this can result in the rockers being thrown off and uh, quite a lot of expensive damage being done. So the the gentler technique there is to use a fuel cut limiter and this is what I'd recommend and this is and this is a very good reason why you need to use an ignition cut and that very good reason would be if you are running a turbocharged drag car and you've got a large turbocharger and you're trying to drive that really hard in order to build boost on the start line. In this case you're going to be needing to use a lot of ignition retard and that strategy will only work well if you are using an ignition cut. Uh, don't worry, we're going to talk a little bit more about how that works very shortly, but essentially just you need to understand if you are using that, there are some downsides and you really need to uh, keep that in consideration with your engine build and make sure that the engine is going to be reliable with that. Okay, so well, let's talk about our uh, two-step launch control first of all and we'll have a look at how that can be set up. So the two-step is the simplest because we really don't need a lot of inputs to the ECU. Uh, you don't need wheel speed, this will often be set up with a clutch switch. So we'll just have a simple digital switch that is connected to the clutch and wired up to the ECU and essentially while that clutch switch is active it'll simply bring in a lower engine RPM limit. So it's very very simple and all we're doing is we're choosing a launch RPM level that's going to allow us to get off the line without m massive amounts of wheel spin uh, but of course we want to launch the engine somewhere where it's actually producing enough torque to uh, turn the wheels and get the car into a little bit of wheel spin so we can start getting moving and then as I've mentioned it's up to the driver of course to modulate the throttle to control uh, the amount of wheel spin that it's getting. So the advantage here is simplicity, we really only need that clutch switch. Uh, one thing I will mention here that is often uh, set up wrong with this style of launch control is that we do want the clutch switch to be quite carefully set up so that the clutch switch is activating right on the point where the clutch is beginning to engage so uh, quite often you'll find that a factory car will have a clutch switch uh, sometimes the clutch switch operation isn't ideal for this type of uh, launch control though so an example here is where the clutch switch happens right at the very top of the pedal so as soon as you start start touching the clutch and start moving it towards the floor, the clutch switch will engage. Now of course the problem here is that as we start releasing the clutch, the clutch will start grabbing or start engaging well before the pedal gets to the top of the travel. So we are sort of launched the car and we are still sitting on our secondary rev limiter. So uh, this can result in the car stalling or at least uh, not getting off the line cleanly. So that's one really key point that we need to keep in mind there. Uh, now I'll just show you quickly here in the Motec software, so let's jump across. This is actually the older Motec. 100 series ECU manager software. Uh, I just want to show you quickly how we can set up that style of launch control. Uh, so if we go into our adjust menu, we'll set this up in our digital input functions. So I uh, just want to show you this on the Motec 100 series ECU software. Uh, there are a couple of varieties or variations on how this will work but uh, the basics or fundamentals are pretty similar so I'm not quite sure where that laptop dropped out here so we'll start again on the adjust menu if we go to our digital input functions and you'll see here that digital input 2 is set up as dual RPM so uh, this is the function that we are setting up and if we click on our parameters uh, this is where we can set up that dual RPM limiter. Uh, not too much to worry about here that's too advanced we've got our logic polarity so this is essentially when the ECU will engage the uh, dual RPM limiter, so basically whether that clutch switch or digital input is in the high or the low uh, state, and then we've got our low RPM rev limiter. So in this case, uh, this is actually for a drag car that we tuned back many years ago. Uh, so the the actual main engine rev limiter is about ten and a half thousand RPM, and we're leaving the line there at seventy two hundred RPM. Uh, so that's as simple as it is. Basically, as soon as the clutch is engaged, the RPM 
RPM limit goes from 7200 up to our normal engine rev limit. Uh, there are a couple of other functions here, RPM rise rate and ignition retard. Uh, I'm not going to touch on these now, we're going to leave those for a moment, we'll talk about those a little bit further through the webinar, that's sort of uh, what some of the more advanced functions there, so just give me a second here, we'll get back to where we were. Okay, so uh, essentially the process for tuning the two-step style launch control uh, is a trial and error approach where uh, we're just going to adjust our secondary rev limiter and try launching the car and really we're just trying to get that nice compromise between a little bit of wheel spin uh, without it ex becoming excessive. Uh, obviously if we've got it set too high when we drop the clutch the car's essentially not going to move and it's just going to sit there uh, and go straight up onto the engine rev limiter. If we, on the other hand, have our RPM launch limit set too low, the car is likely to bog in and the car may, the engine may even stall when we drop the clutch. So uh, really the only way of getting through that is a little bit of trial and error. But the next method we're going to talk about is a lot more advanced and gives us a lot more control and this is where we are going to need a car set up with speed sensors. In particular we're going to need here a speed sensor that's going to give us ground speed. So this is from an undriven wheel. Uh, I will mention here this potentially can be done using a GPS speed input. Uh, I haven't personally done this, this is something we want to test out in the not too distant future. Uh, you cannot do this reliably and effectively though with the standard uh, 10 hertz style GPS that most aftermarket ECUs and dashes are using. Uh, 10 hertz is simply not fast enough in its update to be able to give us launch control or traction control sort of uh, strategies. What we're going to need instead is one of the more expensive 50 hertz style GPSs. So uh, we're hoping to test that. As I say, not in the, in the not too distant future, and then we'll have a little bit more detail around exactly how well that works. All right. So if you've got your uh, speed based input, then what we've got is a lot more functionality now around basically uh, controlling our rev limit based on our ground speed. So this is what we already looked at, let's just jump back across to my laptop screen here. In the MoTeC we've got our three dimensional in this case table of our RPM limit versus our ground speed. But of course the key is where do we come up with the numbers to put into this table? And this is where we are going to need to do some testing. So. What I suggest here is that, uh, we'll just jump across to my laptop screen again, uh, what I suggest here is that you gather some actual solid data to get a lockdown relationship between uh, your engine RPM and your ground speed. So what I've done here, this is actually when we were setting up the launch control strategy on this Toyota 86 here before a race meeting. So at the top here we've got our engine RPM in purple uh, and we've got our throttle position in green, not too worried about that. At the bottom is the key to all of this though, we've got our wheel speeds. So what I've done here is I've just got the car moving, sort of given the, the engine a bit of uh, RPM just to get it moving and then we've engaged the clutch at very low uh, wheel speed or ground speed. So in this case uh, we're sort of only starting at about 7 or 8 kilometres per hour and at this point the clutch is completely engaged. And what we want to do is accelerate the car with absolutely no wheel spins. We're doing this quite smoothly, we're not using a lot of throttle, we're not using a lot of power. We want to accelerate that all the way through to the rev limiter in the top of first gear. So you can see that's exactly what I've done here. Uh, we've only used a maximum of about 57% throttle and we've got up to 8500 RPM. So what we've now got is some solid data on what the uh, wheel speed versus engine RPM relationship is, or ground speed versus uh, engine RPM relationship is in first gear with absolutely no wheel spin. So what we can do is then take this data and use it to populate our launch control uh, ground speed table. So that's back over here. Uh, so for example here at 8500 RPM we can see that we're basically sitting at about 70 uh, kilometres per hour. Uh, so if we come back over to our table, this is what we're going to then be f uh, filling our table in with. Uh, so let's just head back to the start of this table. Uh, so it's important to understand, again, we've got that sort of initial bit where we leave the line. Obviously we can't leave the line with zero RPM. Uh, we need enough RPM to actually get the engine, the, the car to uh, 
generate a little bit of wheel spin and leave the line without the, the engine bogging. So that's a bit of a trial and error method again, exactly like our two-step. And we found that on a dry track with our slicks on this car, uh, 4,500 RPM gave us a pretty good compromise. Uh, it smoothly left the line without uh, a lot of wheel spin and the engine wasn't bogging. The problem is 4,500 RPM, if we go back to our log data and we have a look at what 4,500 RPM gave us, uh, we can say that's going to actually be about 35 kilometers an hour of wheel speed. So this is the problem. If we lock our clutch there and we just jump off the clutch completely, as soon as we do that, the rear wheel speed's going to jump straight up. Let's just draw a little bit of a line. It's probably better than my last attempt. Our rear wheel speed's going to jump straight up and we're going to go something like this. Now, that'll work, but again, remember, what we're trying to get is somewhere around about maybe 8 to 10% wheel slip, so that's not ideal. So we still want to have some clutch slip in there, and what we need to do if we go back to our 3D table here is we actually end up bringing our engine RPM down. So what we can see is we leave a 4,500 RPM, and then between 0 and 15 kilometers an hour, we actually pull our engine RPM back down slightly, and this just helps reduce that massive wheel spin we initially get. We're coupling this of course with the driver manually slipping the clutch a little bit. So we hold about 4300 RPM and then by the time we get to 20 kilometers an hour this is where we actually start the RPM climbing again and this is a key part that a lot of people overlook uh, when they are setting up ground speed based launch control. Uh, we don't want to just hold our initial launch RPM and then increase from there. It's going to result in way too much wheel spin at low ground speed so we actually want want to reduce our RPM and we want to we're going to need to test this because again if we reduce our engine RPM too much we risk having the uh, the engine actually stall or drop off torque and uh, then we're, we're going to uh, be in a bit of trouble so it's a, it's a bit of a balancing act there. Once we get to a point where uh, we can start accelerating the engine though what we're looking for is basically creating just a, a little bit of wheel spin we can do this quite accurately so uh, I don't actually know how well this will work but let's have a look here. So at 50 kilometers an hour let's just have a look and see what our engine RPM is. So I'm just cycling through here we see that our front and our rear wheel speeds were both 50 kilometers an hour and we can see at that point uh, we've got around about 6200 RPM. Uh, so what we can do there if we also look at uh, a 10% slip that would give us about 55 kilometers an hour and we can see 55 kilometers an hour We've got about 5700, uh, sorry, 6700 RPM uh, engine speed. So what we can do is go back to that, and you can see, yeah, I actually have done my job pretty well there. Uh, we've actually got our RPM limit uh, there set at 50 kilometers hour at 66. So again, just trying to get that little bit of wheel spin, maybe around about eight to ten percent. And again, there's a little bit of trial and error comes in here. Uh, we can't say that eight to ten percent wheel spin is a rule of thumb that's applicable to every vehicle, and some testing needs to be done. Of course with the data logging and the launch control strategy the advantage here is that we can do several back to back tests varying our launch RPM table by let's say one or two hundred RPM and quite quickly we should be able to zero in on the sort of numbers in this table that actually give us uh, the best possible results. So then of course once we've got to a point where uh, wheel spin isn't really an issue we can increase the table value so you can see here uh, by the time we get up to 70 kilometers an hour in first gear uh, or even 60 kilometers an hour wheel spin really isn't too much of a consideration at 70k there I've hit uh, 9000 RPM as my launch limit that's actually above the factory uh, the main engine speed limiter so what this means is that the lowest of any of the engine speed limits becomes active so we'd basically be uh, sitting on our 8600 RPM engine speed limit and at this point of course uh, I'm going to be shifting into second gear as well. Alright remember we are going to be having some questions and answers I know this is a complex topic I tried to break it down and make it as simple as I can but yeah it is complex so feel free to ask any questions and I will try and clear those up. Uh, before we get into our questions and answers I just want to talk about a couple of other aspects here which is uh, the more advanced topics of tuning. Uh, 
uh, launch control. So uh, in some ECUs we may also have the ability as well or as an addition to just controlling our launch RPM uh, or our RPM versus ground speed, we may also be able to adjust our drive-by-wire throttle opening. And here what we're doing is we can basically use the drive-by-wire throttle translation to map the throttle opening during first gear. And this allows the driver to stay at wide open throttle, but instead of delivering way more engine torque than we actually need, uh, we can reduce the throttle opening to try and basically match the amount of engine torque being delivered to the amount of traction available. So this just means that our rev limiter isn't working so hard, it's smoother on the engine, and well tuned that can give us a bit of an advantage uh, in terms of our launch control strategy. Uh, the other aspect that I want to talk about here is building boost on a turbocharged engine because this is uh, really important, particularly if you've got a large turbocharger on a small capacity engine. And this is where we may want to have uh, an ignition retard being used to help uh, basically create combustion very late in the engine cycle. Uh, we're also going to be using this generally in conjunction with an ignition cut rev limiter. So we've got unburned fuel and air passing through the engine and combusting in the exhaust system. And when this happens, essentially it pr creates a lot of energy to drive the turbocharger. And uh, using this strategy to our advantage, it's possible to spool turbochargers uh, that traditionally maybe on a small capacity engine we may not see full boost till six or 7,000 RPM. Uh, we can have full boost at maybe as low as four or four and a half thousand RPM for our launch control strategy. Uh, so there's a couple of ways we can do this and uh, we're just going to head back across to my laptop screen and we're going to look here at our MoTeC 100 series again just to try and show you a couple of different variations of how this works uh, and while this isn't going to be the same on every ECU the strategy or fundamentals are the same. So again we're looking at our dual RPM limit here and the aspect that I didn't talk about before was this, this parameter here our ignition retard. So what we can do is use this ignition retard value to uh, retard the ignition timing from the normal ignition table values and we can retard it depending on how we've set this up in the MoTeC either in degrees absolute or we can retard it or sorry degrees from our main table value or we can retard it in uh, a percentage of that main table value. Uh, so this allows us to adjust the ignition retard value and again as I've mentioned this creates combustion late in the engine cycle into the exhaust system and helps build boost. Uh, the problem with this is it's very black and white and it doesn't give us a lot of control. Uh, basically if we wanted to retard the timing there by 30 degrees uh, that's going to be a fixed amount of retard and uh, what we find is that initially to start building boost on the turbocharged engines we may need a lot of retard, 30 degrees probably isn't uncommon, uh, but as the, the turbocharger starts to create boost basically it becomes self-fulfilling and we don't need to uh, use as much retard anymore. So uh, with a system like this where we've got a fixed ignition retard value, what we can find is that the boost actually continues to climb a little bit out of control or at least above uh, where we want it to be. So the way I've actually done this in this particular calibration, let's just have a look. Instead of using that value, I've left it zeroed out and I'm actually using a uh, ignition comp table instead. So we'll go across to ignition comp one. So this is set up as a three dimensional table and what we've got here is our two step position. So uh, whether our clutch switch is in or out and on the load axis here we've got our manifold absolute pressure and what we can see is that when the clutch is uh, engaged so when our foot's off the clutch pedal there's absolutely no compensation being applied here we've just got our normal ignition table our main ignition table values being applied however when our clutch is in, is disengaged when our foot is on the clutch uh, we're going to be operating over in this column one so we can see that uh, down t down in the vacuum areas we've got no trim being made and the reason for this is again if we're every time we put our foot on the clutch we're pulling out 30 degrees of ignition timing uh, this can make the engine really hard to drive around the pits or bring it up to the staging line and uh, what we find is every time we put our foot on the clutch because we're pulling so much retard out of the engine or timing out of the engine the engine can want to stall so this allows us to drive the car around the pits or up to the staging line completely normally but as soon as we go above 95 kPa so essentially we're going to need to be pretty close to wide open throttle uh, we start pulling a little bit of timing 10 degrees in this case uh, then as the RPM builds and 
and we start coming up to 105 kPa, we're pulling 20 degrees. Once we get into the meat of this table here, you can see we're really aggressively pulling out 32 degrees timing. However, in this case, our target boost pressure was 250 kPa, so that's 22 psi of positive boost. Once we go above this, so in this case 260 kPa, you can see that we're actually adding some timing back in. Instead of 32 degrees retard, uh, we're only retarding the timing by 28 degrees. So by setting this table up, we actually got quite a good amount of control and coupling this with a wastegate control table as well to control what the wastegate's doing or where it's opening when we're on the two-step. We can actually get really, really good control of our boost pressure, particularly for a drag application, it's really important to make sure that every time we leave the line uh, we've got the same RPM and we've got the same amount of boost, this gives us consistent parameters to allow us to tune the engine properly and uh, allow us to expect to get good control. Uh, the other aspect here that I just want to talk about, our last topic that I'm going to touch on, again we'll just use the M M800 software, we go back into our digital input functions and we go back to dual RPM and we go into parameters, there's one more parameter here that I haven't talked about yet which is the RPM rise rate. Now at the moment this is actually set to zero so this function does nothing. Uh, it's a really nice function that I use quite a lot with some of the, the four wheel drive drag cars we tuned uh, where we couldn't use a ground speed based launch control table. So here we would have the engine making in this case about 22 psi of boost at 7200 rpm and when the driver sidestep the clutch uh, the engine is obviously producing a lot of power and it is quite possible here that the engine would just break away or the car would break into wheel spin and run straight up onto the engine rev limiter. Now we didn't want that to happen and it is really really hard with these cars to control this with the, the accelerator pedal. So what we did instead was use this rpm rise rate function. So this is essentially dictates how quickly the engine RPM can rise from our low RPM limit, in this case 7200, up to our main engine RPM limiter. So for example if we set this RPM rise rate to 3000 RPM, what that would mean is that it could rise at a rate of 3000 RPM per second and the ECU would instigate, instigate essentially a continuous rev limiter that increased as the time went by uh, to make sure that we didn't break straight into wheel spin. So I kind of used this is a bit of a safety backstop so that if we had a little bit too much power and the car did break into wheel spin it wasn't just going to sit there on the line moving nowhere and running straight onto the RPM, the main engine RPM limit. Alright so complex topic, a lot to take in, hopefully that has helped your understanding there. Remember if you do want a really thorough understanding of this we do have our launch control tuning course uh, which goes into a lot more detail including worked examples that I can't really do justice to here in a short webinar. We'll jump in now and we'll have a look at our questions. First question comes from Craig who's asked, uh, could a clutch solenoid be used to control the clutch control slip with launch control similar to a line lock control? Craig, absolutely and in fact that's exactly what we did with our four wheel drive uh, drag cars. I, I like to think that I was one of the first people to use this and in fact I think it was probably a situation where at the time I was drag racing uh, there were a lot of competitors using this and no one wanted to talk about it. Uh, so I, I don't know where I came in terms of whether we were first or whether we were last but we were definitely using it to our advantage. So what I was actually doing just to explain the system in detail, uh, what I was doing was I was plumbing a modified boost control valve, this was a manual uh, Turbo Smart Boost T into my clutch line and uh, essentially what we were doing there is the boost T could be used to control how quickly or how slowly the clutch pedal would release. So the driver could come up to the line, stage the car and then when the tree counted down it could just literally sidestep the clutch and the clutch pedal would actually take almost two full seconds uh, to come back up from the floor. So this made sure that the clutch would slip as the car came off the line and this transformed all of our cars from uh, uh, cars that would uh, be very difficult to get consistent launches to ones that were cutting uh, really, really good reaction times and really good 60 foot times. Uh, the Evo 9 that we built that claimed the world record that uh, ran consistent 1260 60 foot, uh, which uh, only recently we've seen a few cars go faster than that. So uh, yeah, really, really important, particularly for a four wheel drive drag car uh, to get consistency there. Uh, Andy has asked what happens when uh, both front wheels are in the air. Uh, well if both front wheels are in the air you're probably going to have a bit of trouble getting ground speed aren't you. Uh, the issue is that uh, this is really something we're using predominantly for circuit racing. Uh, we're using ground speed based 
based launch control uh, and I have not been fortunate enough to tune any circuit cars that launch with the front wheels in the air. Definitely more of an issue for drag racing, however drag racing in a lot of instances uh, specifically prohibits a lot of these uh, ground speed based launch control strategies that I have talked about. There's ways around this though, uh, a lot of the, the very powerful two wheel drive drag cars will be using a uh, profiler, uh, a, a, an, sorry, excuse me, I'll try and get my words out, and Haltec with their uh, race expansion module, they include torque management, and essentially what they're doing there is profiling the drive shaft RPM versus time, so prof profiling a perfect pass, and how fast the uh, drive shaft RPM increases versus time during the run, and if the car breaks into wheel spin, of course the drive shaft RPM is going to spike, and then uh, the torque management strategy can can do something about that, either fuel or ignition cutting or uh, ignition retard. So uh, no matter how you want to go about this or what the perceived rules are in a class, there's always uh, potential ways around this. Uh, Quentin has asked, for older cars with no existing wheel speed, ground speed data or ABS sensors, have you retrofitted a ground speed sensor? And if so, what's the method you'd normally use to retrofit wheel speed? Uh, there's a variety of options there. Uh, it's pretty easy normally to fit a speed sensor uh, depending on what you've got to pick up from. Uh, a pretty common technique if you've got access to them is to fit a speed sensor, uh, a, uh, a reluctant style or variable reluctant style sensor that picks up on the back of the wheel studs if you can get access to those. Uh, that's pretty easy. Uh, another way of doing this is uh, you can actually pick it up off the wheel. Uh, so really it comes, or, or the, the, the brake rotor, really comes down to just what you've got easy access to uh, but there is going to be a little bit of ingenuity in mounting a system like that up. Darius has asked, could a pressure sensor be used on a clutch line to act as a position sensor and maybe have a gradual transition instead of an on-off switch? Okay, so uh, on face value you'd think that this might be a sensible approach and it's certainly something that, that I considered for a while until I sort of did a bit more homework on it. Uh, the problem with it is that the clutch pressure is not uh, something that we can correlate directly to clutch position. And for, that, for the reason that the clutch pressure during the initial part of the clutch travel is actually going to stay relatively consistent. It will move around a little bit just depending on the uh, the position of the diaphragm and the pressure that that's exerting but uh, yeah you can't really use pressure alone to, to uh, correlate clutch uh, position. Uh, you can use a clutch position sensor though, it's possible to fit a rotary or a linear travel sensor to your clutch pedal. Uh, this can even be done at the clutch slave cylinder so uh, again that's something that you can use to get a lot more information. The problem is though uh, you still need a way of manually controlling this and this is where uh, the driver being able to, to manually slip the clutch a controlled amount repeatedly every start is very difficult which is why we come back to the answer to Craig's question where we can use a solenoid and a bleed valve to control the rate that the clutch is engaged. Uh, Mark Williams has asked, any uh, extra concerns or tips for four wheel drive launch control? I've sort of touched on this, I mean this kind of was my specialty I guess uh, through the last 10 years of my old shop where four wheel drive drag racing was kind of uh, our, our main, uh, main thing and yeah, you can't use uh, ground speed based launch control with this sort of system. There's a couple of ways of doing it. I've already talked about the uh, RPM rise rate, actually a technique that I didn't mention there is that in a lot of ECUs uh, we also have the ability to provide uh, timer based functions. So uh, with that four wheel drive system you could instigate a timer based RPM limit. Uh, the problem with this is it's a passive system and it, if something goes wrong you don't get the perfect launch that timer is still going to be counting down and doing the same thing every time. Uh, so it is something that you're going to need to really play with and uh, and test to get something that's working. And the other option of course which uh, I've touched on in this webinar, haven't really done it ourselves yet, is a high speed GPS based launch control strategy for four wheel drive drag cars. Uh, I know that one of the people that we interviewed at World Time Attack Challenge which is, uh, God now I can't remember his name has a very fast Subaru drag car from Scotland, 
hopefully someone in the comments is going to be able to pick up the name that I've currently forgotten. Uh, running four-wheel drive, drivetrain there with a Cybex ECU. He was using a 50 hertz GPS with uh, ground speed based, or sorry, GPS based launch control. So uh, it, it, it's potentially possible. Andy White. A Andy White? Yeah. Andy from Scotland anyway. There we go. Andy Forrest, that's the one. Thank you. <sighs> Got there in the end. Uh, Dave has asked, I'm adding a clutch slipper this year on my sport front wheel drive car. Is there a general rule of how far out to slip the clutch? Uh, two feet, five feet, 20 feet, etc. I've been doing it manually with good results, but it's so inconsistent. Uh, okay, so from my own experience, and admittedly, this is all four wheel drive based. I haven't been involved with the tuning of any sport front wheel drive cars, is that you're actually probably going to need to slip the clutch quite a lot longer than you would initially think. And uh, I, I, I believe in our four wheel drive drag cars, ultimately we were slipping the clutch essentially the whole way through first gear. And it's all about maintaining uh, or Lim reducing that uh, initial uh, wheel spin that you're going to get with a very high launch RPM like we looked at in our MoTeC example there that was from our Evo 9 drag car launching the the car at 7200 RPM uh, let's just say for round numbers that was going to give it a ground speed of 60 kilometers an hour uh, so initially when we first dropped the clutch at 7200 RPM that would involve the wheel spinning at 60 kilometers an hour massive amounts of wheel spin huge amounts of slip we're not going to get good traction like that so uh, I yeah, I generally would start with our four-wheel drive drag cars with the clutch movement taking around about 1.5 to 2 seconds and then I would tune from there. And the advantage with that clutch slipper that we were using is, uh, the, if anyone's used the Turbo Smart Boost T, uh, it is graduated every time you move it a little bit, it clicks so you've got really fine control over exactly how much slip that clutch has. It doesn't take you very long to dial it in. I will just mention here a really big downside with that system is because you are creating a lot of clutch slip obviously you're going to be burning out clutch plates pretty quickly and we're going through a triple plate clutch in about 10 passes so uh, yeah it's uh, it's no free lunches in this world unfortunately uh, Jay's asked when using anti-lag with launch control or rolling anti-lag on a daily driven street car uh, can it destroy the exhaust valves and turbo if only used for brief periods like three to five seconds at a time five to ten times per week okay uh, I, I see where your question's going there Jay and I'd love to be able to give you the confidence that you can do exactly that uh, but there are just so many uh, variations and and uh, aspects that go into this that could affect your end result generally I would say that short bursts of rolling anti-lag or launch control like that uh, shouldn't do any damage uh, but again as I've mentioned as well you do need to consider the base engine configuration and whether that engine has a nice strong reliable valve train uh, the problem with a very aggressive rolling launch controller anti-lag strategy is that those big pulses of pressure that occur in the exhaust system from com combustion do tend to pop the exhaust valves back off the seat and when this happens particularly if you've got a hydraulic lifter uh, arrangement this can pump that lifter up and then hold the valve open and of course then if you've got a rocker style system uh, valve actuation this can involve the rocker falling off. Loki has asked uh, how can the launch control be tuned for different road surfaces could it be adjusted via rotary dial controlled by the driver uh, yeah absolutely Loki that's that's kind of what I was getting at with our three dimensional table in the MoTeC M1 there that's a driver uh, rotary switch that we can move on that vertical axis and uh, you could use this for wet or dry tr dry road conditions uh, I'm basically using this on tarmac for circuit racing so we've already just got a reasonably consistent surface it's just with a whether it's wet, whether it's dry, whether it's just slightly damp. Uh, of course, you could make much more dramatic changes to suit gravel versus tarmac as well if you've got a rally car. Uh, Victor has asked, uh, during doing launch control on a stock turbo with a little more boost uh, with a cat, does the cat make more damage for the engine? Uh, the cat won't make more damage for the engine, but you do need to be very careful with that launch control because uh, if you are using an ignition cut style launch control or you're passing unburnt fuel into the exhaust system, uh, that can damage the cat. Likewise, the uh, explosions that occur with an aggressive launch control strategy on a turbocharged car, that will also quickly destroy your catalytic converter, so you do need to understand that. Uh, I would suggest if you are going to use launch control with a uh, an engine still equipped with a catalytic converter that you make sure you are using a fuel cut launch control and make sure that the engine is nice and smooth on that limiter. Uh, Barry has asked, uh, what would you recommend as the best method to reference ground speed when tu turning 
when tuning tuning four wheel drive cars where all wheels are driven. Uh, so same same answer really. There, Barry is uh, it's difficult. You can't really use gr uh, a wheel speed to to correlate to ground speed because as you've mentioned there, if you've got wheel spin, all four wheels are spinning together. Particularly in our drag cars, we ran a, a, essentially a locked transmission or locked four wheel drive differential. So uh, if one wheel spun, all of them were spinning. Uh, GPS there is probably your best option. But again, if you want to use that for a launch control strategy, uh, you're going to want to get a high frequency uh, GPS, at least 20 hertz, preferably 50. Uh, Side Engineering has asked, what are your thoughts on integration of drive shaft speed as opposed to a timer applied to the rising rate of engine speed? Uh, also, what are your thoughts on accelerometer data for measuring acceleration as opposed to looking at the slip ratio between driven and non-driven wheel speed data? Okay, two questions in there. I'll actually deal with your second question first because uh, that was something I actually meant to show and talk about. So thanks actually for bringing that up. Uh, so yeah, if you've got a G sensor on the car, uh, it is a really good idea when you are doing your testing to log longitudinal G-force. And then what you can do as you're making small adjustments to your launch control strategy, look at overlays with that longitudinal G-force. So that will show you whether you are making small improvements or you're going backwards because the G sensor is going to be much more sensitive than, uh, than you are. Uh, so it's going to pick up those subtle small changes in acceleration force. And the other thing is when you are tuning this, you may find that you pick up uh, acceleration in one area of your launch strategy or launch phase, but then you actually end up going backwards in another area. So if you are looking at the longitudinal G-force, then you can decide where to pinpoint those changes, where you've made those improvements, keep those and fix the areas that you've gone backwards. Now, uh, integration of of drive shaft speed as opposed to a time applied to rising rate of engine speed. Um, I'd need to probably think about this a little bit more detail. Basically, uh, for a manual transmission, uh, if your clutch isn't slipping, uh, the issue you're going to have is that your drive shaft speed essentially is uh, directly correlated to your engine RPM. Uh, so I'm not sure where you're going with this if you're talking about uh, for that first portion where you've got wheel slip. I'm not too sure there, oh, sorry, clutch slip. Uh, as I've kind of mentioned in another question, again, not sure if this was your angle, uh, a lot of the drag cars, they are using the uh, drive shaft speed as a kind of uh, subtle traction control strategy, but uh, yeah, not 100% sure exactly where you are uh, aiming with that one, sorry. All right, guys, that has brought us to the end of our questions. Hopefully, I've made that topic a little bit easier to understand. Uh, there is a lot to take in, and of course, as usual, if you've got other questions that come up after this webinar has aired, please ask those in our forum, and I'll be happy to answer them there. Thanks heaps for joining us. I look forward to seeing everyone next time. That was just a taste of what we put on every week for our HPA Gold members. We've currently got over 240 hours of existing webinar content covering topics on engine building, engine tuning and wiring. Click the link in the description to learn more.